Good morning and welcome. Moss Adams is pleased to present today's webcast, COVID-19's impact on single audits, what you need to know. Before we begin, I'm gonna play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams Government Services Practice. Matt Parsons, partner, and Amy Sutherland, senior manager. With that, I'll turn it over to Amy to get us started. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. And for those of you not joining us from the West Coast, I guess good afternoon. Um, I am Amy Sutherland, a senior manager uh, with Moss Adams. I am joining you from the lovely suburbs of Seattle, Washington. Joining me today is Matt Parsons, a partner. Um, he's joining us from lovely Orange County, California. Um, both of us do work with a variety of uh, state and local government clients, and we're here to share with you some interesting tidbits. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about COVID-19 funding um, and specifically how it is starting to show up and impact a lot of the single audits that we are performing um, and working on with our clients. In addition, we're gonna cover a few uh, revisions that were made to uniform guidance this last year. Uh, for those of you who may be not familiar, uniform guidance is the federal regulations behind federal grant funding and awards. It's what drives the uh, requirement for single audit um, compliance. So with any good CPE course, of course, we have some learning objectives. Um, in our short time together, we really do hope that you walk away with some pers perspective on some of the key issues facing folks working in the government sector um, as it relates to the federal grant programs and single audits. Uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna also identify some changes that were made to uniform guidance and hopefully some uh, things for you to take away and, and additional things to do um, based on what you hear today. 
with that, we're going to get into talking about really what the focal point has been for most of us this last year, um, which is really personally and professionally dealing with the impact of COVID-19 and the related public health emergency. It's pretty amazing when you sit here 14, 15 months later and think about everything that has happened um, since January of last year. Um, it's pretty crazy how quickly a few um, news interviews or a, a news articles about this new virus in Asia quickly turned into um, what has certainly been the most unprecedented time of my lifetime, um, which is really dealing with a true global pandemic. Um, and in a short amount of time between January and March, we had a whole bunch of federal and then quickly state and local government public emergencies declared um, that in many cases has closed down a lot of, a lot of our, our world as we've known it. Um, the federal government quickly within uh, March of last year issued three different funding acts that really produced a significant amount of the initial funding um, that was used to combat the initial virus and the public um, health emergency. Then in August of 2020, uh, the OMB issued the 2020 Compliance Supplement, um, which for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with it, is really the guidebook that auditors use in determining what is audited in terms of federal grant compliance. So it's a very important document in terms of really understanding what federal agencies are looking or expecting auditors to do. Um, because all of this March funding created a lot of new programs, um, unfortunately, we also had to wait around until very late in December to get a compliance supplement addendum that really addressed a lot of that new funding that was released during the course of the year. And then because things still haven't slowed down um, in December and then again in March of this year, we have additional funding acts that have continued to pour additional federal funding um, into the economy and into a lot of you. And so with that, we're gonna go to our first polling question. So for those of you looking for CPE today, it's super important, pay attention, make a selection, submit your results. Um, how much additional federal funding has your organization received related to COVID? Um, you got answer of none, or maybe you don't know. Um, up to about $750,000 of new funding. Uh, C is 750 to about 5 million of new funding. D, 5 million to about 25 million. And then E, over 25 million. So again, how much additional federal funding has your organization received as a result of COVID? Matt, while people are answering, what's kind of your sense with the clients you've, you've dealt with? Are they seeing a lot of additional funding? Is it a little bit all over the place? Yeah, thanks, Amy. When I think back to you know ARA back in 2008 and the level of funding we saw there, um, the, the magnitude this time around has been much greater. So I think most of my clients have been seeing between that five to $25 million mark and a couple over 25 million. So I, I'd be surprised if we didn't see some big numbers. Yeah, I, I would certainly agree. Um, yes, so based on our, our results here, we have about 52% of you are over the 5 million mark with you know, over 30% of you seeing more than $25 million in additional funding. Um, it's certainly been a very uh, interesting and crazy time, um, which leads to our next point, which is if you look through as of the last funding act, which is the American Rescue Plan Act, um, right now the United States has appropriated over $5 trillion towards a variety of programs and measures in response to COVID-19. Um, and certainly, as all of us know, based on the news, there's still at least talk of an infrastructure bill and another uh, American Families First bill. So I, this number at this point is likely to continue to grow. For some perspective, um, this $5 trillion is slightly more than what was spent on World War II, um, sort of inflating to current dollars. The U.S. spent about $4.7 trillion as part of World War II. 
And as Matt just mentioned, you know, the last sort of bigger uh, recovery type program we saw was ARA, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act back in 20, 2009. Um, that was estimated to be about $840 billion. So certainly um, the amount of federal funding that is currently flowing is very tremendous and it's having a very significant impact. I think what's also made um, the COVID funding, especially for 2020, immensely unique is because of the need to respond quickly um, and act quickly related to the virus. Um, what happened was a very unusual set of um, circumstances where most of that March funding came out very quickly. The idea was we, you know, the government certainly wanted to get money in people's hands, wanted to ensure especially from a public health perspective, that there was money available to help treat people who are ill, um, to fund what was originally some research into the vaccines. And if really just the, the idea of there was a, a state of emergency and it was important to get the funding out there. The problem is <laughs> the money came first and then the rules and regulations got written afterwards. Um, it made it incredibly challenging for, for those of us that are really used to having a grant agreement in our hand, understanding the terms and conditions and knowing what it's meant for and having a way to monitor and judge whether the funding was being used correctly. In this case, um, the money came out and people were sort of generally given some very high level principles about what to do with it. But then the rules and regulations started getting written and frankly, and frankly, we're changing almost on a daily basis, at least if not weekly. And it made it really challenging for people to continue to monitor what, what was coming out and ensuring that money that had already been spent um, was being spent appropriately. So as we just talked about in our last polling question, uh, a significant number of you saw over $5 million in new funding for your organization. So in our next polling question here, did your organization increase the number of employees supporting federal funded programs? Your options are no, in fact, we lost people. C, no, we may do with who we had. Uh, C, yes, but only by repurposing existing people or headcount. Or D, yes, we had to hire more people. Um, again, how did your organization respond to the influx of federal funding? Matt, what did you kind of see with your clients? Um, you mentioned a lot of them received some significant new funding. Were you seeing as a result additional hires or just scrambling to, to, do, to put out these programs with the folks they had? Yeah. I think, you know, many would have hired more people if they could uh, have. Um, there was a lot of restrictions going on with a lot of different programs and um, trying to be cautious over what, you know, this full impact would be. So I think most of my clients really um, made do with who they had. Um, and in some circumstances, unfortunately, you know, lost people um, that they, they could have used. Um, so it's been a big burden for a, a lot of existing staff to be able to um, come through these different agreements, understand them, um, and make sure that they're remaining compliant. Yeah, I would certainly agree. I think what I've, I've certainly seen, depending on uh, what type of government, um, you know, especially at like a state level that received a lot of funding that they in turn created programs to pass funds through, you know, there were some uh, state agencies that found themselves um, responsible for federal programs that I think maybe historically hadn't dealt with a lot of federal awards. Um, you know, a lot of the de Department of Commerce's and other sorts of departments that really all of a sudden had significant new funding that they needed to do things with. And I think it was a real scramble to try to utilize um, existing folks uh, to get these funds out there. Um, certainly there was uh, a huge um, incentive at all levels of government to try to put this money to work. Um, and unfortunately, you don't necessarily have time to hire, or in a lot of cases, there were hiring freezes going on um, as a result of other budgetary pressures. Looks like overall, our responses were primarily no, we had to make do with what we had. I, I certainly would agree. I think that's what I saw in a lot of places. 
Um, or in the next one, 20% of you had to repurpose existing people. Um, I think overall that's very consistent with what we've seen in our own practice. So really one of the biggest challenges that has come out of a lot of these 2020 um, federal awards is it's been incredibly challenging at times to determine when an award was actually made. Um, as I just mentioned, you know, funding got put out there as quickly as possible, um, but there wasn't necessarily a lot of rules and regulations around it. And in turn, states and counties and cities quickly were putting programs together to try to turn the funds around and get it passed on through to other organizations. And as a result, um, in a lot of cases, traditional grant award documents or other um, forms of documentation weren't really consistently being used. It's made it challenging to understand um, what was the actual award date and what what really are the terms and conditions of the awards. Um, I think it's even been more complicated by the fact that a lot of these awards allowed um, organizations to go back to previous periods or points of time in order to um, accumulate costs that could be reimbursed with these funding. So it's made it even more challenging than normal to sort of think about what, what is my award, what are my costs, what period do they apply to, um, and then even more importantly, as we've gotten to um, the first fiscal year ends for a lot of organizations, it's made it even more challenging to think about how do I fill in the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. Um, the issues around timing of when an award is made is incredibly important because that drives to some extent what period some of this activity is reported for um, reported for compliance purposes in the CIFA. And the CIFA is incredibly important from an auditor's perspective because this is how we determine what major programs um, are required to be tested. It's, it's incredibly important to um, the federal agencies as a lot of this information is provided through the clearinghouse so they have an understanding of the types of awards organizations have. As I mentioned, some of these awards really are allowing organizations to go back in time and apply the award to costs that were incurred in previous previous periods. So conceptually, um, I think what most of us are used to is there was always a bit of a match between what goes on your CIFA and when a cost was reported for financial statement purposes. In some cases, depending on your year end, that no longer matches. Um, I think I, I noticed a, a, a question already from someone in the audience about well, hey, I got an award in January of 2021, but it, it's allowing me to go back to 2020 um, and apply it to costs that I incurred then. When do I report it? Um, for CIFA purposes, you can't report something until it's been awarded. So in this case, even though your 2021 award allows you to go back in time, you couldn't actually report it for a, a CIFA purpose until 2021. This has even been more complicated because <laughs> The uh, funding last year and again this year is introducing this concept of lost revenue. So not only are we um, complicating things by allowing you to accumulate costs from prior periods, we're now giving you money that's not even associated with specific costs. Um, based on the rules around how you can come up with lost revenue calculations, you're able to apply federal funding to this idea of lost revenue. Um, that also brings some complications because, again, what period of time did that lost revenue occur versus when you receive this award and can actually utilize the funding? So I would certainly say by far the biggest challenge we're really seeing right now is helping organizations and auditors come, come to some <laughs> a level of comfort over what is included in the CEPA. Um, this definitely means that there's a lot more time and effort going into some of the initial planning around single audit, probably a lot more questions and testing that's being um, done around just trying to ensure awards that are made have the right documentation, that there's agreement about when the award started, and really just trying to get comfortable that the CIFA has all of the right information and awards on it. Um, I would say some of these issues certainly have existed before, 
Um, it's just incredibly more prevalent because of the issues around when grants were put out, when the funding was put out in 2020. Um, and this is, I think, going to continue to be a very significant challenge um, in 2021 and going forward as most of these funding programs have been extended. Um, even the new 2021 programs now are utilizing this concept of lost revenue to a greater extent. So I think we're going to continue to see these challenges with CIFAs and what's reported when, um, at least for the next couple of years. So <laughs> if 2020 alone wasn't already challenging, um, we decided to make things a little bit more interesting by, of course, having a change in the federal administration. Um, what I will say so far about 2021 is certainly there's more funding already out there and will continue to be put out there, but there's also a very different tone being heard out of DC. Um, there is really a new set of expectations or maybe what I would call a resetting of expectations that rules and regulations are to be developed before the funding is released. And I think we're already seeing that in terms of some of the delays that have been happening between when the American Rescue Plan was approved and when the actual funding has started to um, be released. There's certainly a lot more thought being put into what are the terms and conditions and trying to provide that information ahead of releasing the funding. Um, this is further seen in uh, the OMB memo that was issued earlier this year in March to the federal agencies. Um, and this memo really only applies to the federal agencies, but I think it's important for you to understand what was in it because it really is setting a tone um, that all of us are going to be expected to follow. Um, the memo basically is providing guidance to the federal agencies saying that for all of the programs that are developed out of the American Rescue Plan, you really have to have rules and regulations. You have to go back to following the requirements under 2 CFR, which is uniform guidance. Um, it's really also emphasizing the importance of accountability, um, transparency, and really, again, trying to refocus federal agencies on ensuring that programs that are being developed have objectives, have goals, and things that can be measured against. There's also a greater emphasis on equity-oriented results. Um, I think we're already seeing that in terms of specific set-asides for different populations. Um, and there's going to be a lot more focus on that and trying to ensure that funding is being distributed in some sort of equitable way. And then there's also a greater expectation that the uniform guidance requirements are also going to be applied to for-profit entities. This is a pretty significant change. Um, historically, uniform guidance, and if you read uniform guidance, single audits and the compliance auditing is traditionally only applied to governments and other not-for-profit agencies. Um, and so historically, a lot of for-profit entities have never been subject to some of these guidelines and rules, certainly haven't been subject to compliance auditing. And it's causing a lot of um, concern and certainly a lot of questions out there um, as commercial entities haven't been through this process before. In addition, um, the memo also reiterates the importance of timely reporting and clarified that all spending under this act is subject to the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act, so FAFATA, for those of you um, who have heard the terminology before. Um, that originally started under ARA, and it places responsibility on direct recipients of federal awards to report specific information to federal agencies. So this is highly applicable to states, cities, counties, who are really typically the direct recipient of a lot of these federal awards. And lastly, and most relevant to all of you, um, it included a new extension of the single audit deadline. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a couple more slides, um, but certainly was probably the one big thing, at least from a recipient standpoint, um, that people were happy to see. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Matt to talk a little bit about the impact this has had on our single audit. Thanks, Amy. I'm still reeling over some of the statistics about the, just the volume of federal funding we've seen in response to COVID. 
Um, you know, I know a lot of these programs have, you know, urgency related to them and, and that money should be spent as soon as possible to provide relief to the public. Um, but it seems like with this volume, we're going to see th these programs stay with us for a couple of years. And so um, uh, now that we've had the opportunity to see uh, the types of fundings that have been um, issued, we thought we'd dive a little bit deeper into navigating the, the compliance nuances of um, actually uh, spending the money and, and what those restrictions are. Um, and making sure that you as a recipient are documenting everything to prepare for a potentially smooth audit. Um, I, I know Amy already touched a little bit about the compliance supplement. I just want to give a little bit more context. So, you know, each year the Office of Management and Budget issues an annual compliance supplement on behalf of the president. And the compliance supplement is really this uh, coordination of all the different federal agencies. So, you know, Health and Human Services, Department of Labor, HUD, Treasury, et cetera. And its main objective is really to provide auditors that important uh, this important compliance areas that the federal agencies expect to be considered as part of our audits. Um, it's a pretty big undertaking when you think about it, you know, just the level of funding we've seen in these huge programs. Um, so coming up with comprehensive guidance that everyone can actually agree to is pretty tough. So the effective date of each compliance supplement is for fiscal years beginning July, July 1st of the previous year. So that means you know, we're thinking about June 30 year entities are typically the first to undergo an audit with whatever those most, re most recent guidance um, that's available. Um, the timing of when that compliance supplement's been issued has been pretty erratic over the last few years, even really before the pandemic started. And last year's compliance supplement was, it wasn't actually issued until August 2020. So it's two months after the June year end for many of these organizations. And the supplement pretty much only covered, you know, those programs that were existing pre-COVID. And so some of you might be asking, you know, what is the reason for, you know, some of these delays? And really it's because um, these, these federal agencies were preoccupied with coming up with FAQs and other guidance for the COVID programs that they just couldn't get um, to the compliance supplement. Um, we, we heard the OMB had promised that an addendum uh, to that supplement was in the works and would be focusing on addressing those COVID, those new COVID fundings. However, that ultimately wasn't issued until December of 2020. Um, so both of these supplements were applicable to audits of fiscal years ending June 30th, 2020. So if you're tracking that, you know, normally an entity would have nine months from after the end to complete a single audit. And auditors often didn't know what they were testing until almost six months um, after those June 30 year end. So not a lot of time for prepare and definitely uh, resulting in, in bigger delays in issuing reports than we've seen historically in the past. Uh, and we're already getting questions from clients about, you know, when will the 2021 compliance supplement be issued? Um, the timing is still unclear. Uh, we've heard information from the OMB that it, it's supposed to be scheduled back on time, but we know with some of these new um, uh, different um, acts that have been passed, it's probably going to take a little longer for them to provide guidance on, on how to audit, you know, those new spending allocations. So here's a great table that, you know, just highlights, again, basically uh, year on your fiscal year end, um, when the extension applies to. Um, originally, the extension was only for organizations with due dates between October 2020 through June 2021. Um, so that, again, uh, equates to like fiscal year ends in January 2020, September 2020. Um, but the, on this language, the year in 1231-20 should, would not have had an extension. Um, but the good news is that um, due to the tremendous feedback from both auditors and auditees about you know, the lack of guidance, the significant delays by the OMB in issuing the compliance supplement, and sort of the ongoing evolution of rules around 2020 COVID federal programs, in March of 2021, the OMB issued a memo that actually further extended the deadline uh, virtually for all year ends and made it applicable beyond just the original September 30, 2020 year ends. Um, really all the way going progressively forward through even June 2021 year ends. Will there be another extension? I don't know. Um, as you can see, it's been difficult really to keep up with, but it's even been even more difficult to figure out uh, what to audit. Um, so hopefully I'm not coming off as uh, too whiny about us poor auditors. Uh, we know it's been frustrating for you as well as recipients. So let's touch on maybe some of those pain points. Oh, but first we have a polling question. Um, is your organization planning to utilize the extended due date? Uh, so the responses we have are, no, we believe we can file based on the normal due date. Uh, yes, we're planning on an extended due date, or we're undecided and need to talk to our auditors. 
Amy, anything about what you've been experiencing with your clients? Have uh, many of them decided to push, or have you been uh, readily processing through uh, reports to get them completed for this yeah, I, fiscal year? Um, I would certainly say uh, right now, 1231-2020 audit, um, it really has sort of depended on the amount of COVID-19 related funding they've had. Some, some have been able to at least stick to their normal timing. Um, but we also have a, a number of others that received so much funding and it was related to some of these programs where we didn't have a lot of guidance until the supplement addendum came out. Um, but those are certainly being delayed. People are taking advantage of the extended due dates. Um, and I think that's going to continue to happen even into this year, especially if you're a, a June 30 year end this year. And if you're receiving some of the significant new funding out of the American Rescue Plan, my expectation is we're not going to have guidance on a lot of that stuff from an audit perspective until later this year. So I think, again, it, it really depends on the type of uh, funding people had um, and whether or not uh, the, the regulations are out there sufficient for everyone to feel comfortable doing it. Great point. Thanks, Amy. Uh, so just looking at the results of the uh, question, it looks like um, pretty much 40% of you believe that um, you've either probably already filed uh, by your normal due date um, or are working with uh, your auditors. Um, looks like nobody has, not, not many people have uh, planned on a due, extending their due date, but I know as things progress and those deadlines um, come closer, then some of those decisions change. Great. So um, when it comes to the single audit extension, one common question we've been asked is whether Federal Audit Clearinghouse will recognize that an entity is eligible for extension. Um, so similar to how extensions have been handled in the past, the Clearinghouse really just notes the date it was ex submitted and accepted. It's really up to the auditors and the federal agencies to figure out you know, if this means it was submitted timely. And it's important because you know, it impacts the assessment by an auditor whether an entity can be considered a low risk auditee and whether you're a low risk auditee or not directly impacts the percentage of award expenditures that are subject um, to audit. So again, with the volume we're seeing, that could have a pretty big impact on um, planning and, and scheduling and um, coordinating. So um, it's important that you um, talk to your auditors and, and make sure that they're concluding. And, and if, for example, they've concluded that you filed late, you know, just confirm that, they, um, that these dates have been considered and these extensions um, prior to their conclusion. Um, with that said, it really is still management's responsibility to document the reason why a report um, needed to file an extension from that original nine-month deadline. Um, I, I wouldn't expect your auditors to necessarily have it, so make sure you put it in a safe place in your own records. Uh, and one area I would caution you on is just being mindful of certain state and local submission deadlines. You know, we know that not all of them extended um, to the same latitude, so it's important to be proactive you know, in your communication uh, with other types of awards and you know, why specific deliverables that they're looking for so that your organization uh, still remains compliant. So diving a little bit more into the actual types of funding that were new this year, provider relief funding, um, I'm not sure really how many of you today work with entities that receive provider relief funds, but you know one of the biggest surprises in the compliance supplement addendum was that the federal agency directed recipients to not report these on the CFA if you have a year end prior to December 31st, 2020. Um, and this is essentially a departure from trying to get your CFA to reconcile to your accounting records. Um, and that's really in large part due to this ongoing debate about how the lost revenue for this program will be reported. So any expenditures and lost revenue will not be again included on the CFA as a half fiscal year ends before December 31st, even if they were um, had active PRF awards for earlier periods. Um, and, and that really the reason again is to align the CFA reporting to this new developed report that the Department of Health and Human Services is um, coming out with. Um, I know this guidance was issued pretty late, you know, in December 2020 is when we got that information and some organizations already issued the reports with this funding on their CFA. Uh, before this guidance came out. Um, so it might not have been triggered as a major program then. I would encourage you to talk to your auditors, but depending on you know, additional allocations of this funding, there may be a need to report them again in your upcoming fiscal year so that when that new developed report is issued, there is a reconciliation between what's reported on your CFA and what goes in uh, that report. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, Here's just a great graphic, too, of a table of trying to uh, make sense of, again, what I was saying between your year end and what an expectation is to report it. 
you know, going forward after June 30, 2021, we don't have guidance again on that. Um, our expectation is that the upcoming compliance supplement will give us uh, further direction. So additionally, there's expect, as I mentioned, there's expected to be a special report um, related to provider relief funds. Um, today, the Department of Health and Human Services has still not opened the reporting portal um, that would allow uh, organizations to do this reporting. Um, really, the only, as of this morning, when I last checked, is a registration. Um, organizations um, uh, can log on so that they can be prepared for when the report is out. Um, ultimately, what is reported again on the system is expected to correlate what is reported on the CIFA. Um, and so for auditors, this has been a bit unique, you know, as, as they've been asked to perform testing um, on some, a report that hasn't actually been developed yet. And it's important for both, you know, you as your organization as well as auditors um, to understand you know, the classification of these costs and how that's going to be eventually reported. Um, that plays into samples, that plays into risk assessment. Um, so that's why, again, we're, we're seeing a lot of these reports being delayed um, for that funding because, of, um, again, that report's not out yet. Um, the most recent guidance on the use of funds was actually published um, in, in March of 2021. One of the biggest challenges is thinking through, you know, what costs have been reimbursed or covered through other various means, um, because if that's the case, you wouldn't be allowed to, again, recoup funds under this program. So just for example, um, you know, payments that maybe are, were covered through a reimbursement through sources like such as Medicaid or Medicare um, would not be eligible again for reimbursement under this program. Um, in February, Health and Human Services did confirm that the time spent by staff and directors on COVID-19 specific matters might be an eligible allowable cost. The challenge has really been becoming, um, you know, how do you support these costs and the documentation to really make sure that they're tangible just as opposed to an opportunity cost. Um, and one recommendation from the FAQs is really to apply a, like a logic test on the expenses that are being identified in this program. So, you know, for example, if you compare your supply costs back in 2019, to what's in 2020, um, then sort of calculating that change year over year and identifying what that portion really relates to COVID um, complications or um, uh, responsiveness, that will give you a much cleaner ability to sort of um, uh, work through what, what's truly allowable. So again, determining lost revenue is convoluted and a lot of items might steer you off course. Um, but lost revenue really relates to patient care services. So for example, you know, if you have a parking lot, a cafeteria, other ancillary revenue streams that come um, into a healthcare provider's location, that wouldn't be eligible as part of this location. Um, another good option is comparing 2019, 2020 net revenue by payer to see what fluctuations look like um, and provide some context again to your methodology. Uh, so the next program we thought we'd touch on is the Coronavirus Relief Fund. I just wanna hit a couple of items. Um, that have come up as part of audits we've started. What we're finding is that a lot of the Sierra funding was passed through from state and local governments to other entities. There's a high amount of variety in the type of documentation we've seen related to those awards. In some cases, you know, a state didn't use traditional grant agreement, um, so it's not always clear um, in the information. Um, in other cases, states use a traditional grant award document, which um, included allowing subrecipients to use indirect cost rates to claim administrative costs. However, per the Treasury guidance, um, Sierra Fund is specifically um, unallowed to use uh, indirect costs as part of this award. So if you're seeing this in your grant awards or with your clients, um, you know, you need to revisit this um, and, and talk to your awarding agency. Um, the other issue we're seeing is that the Treasury essentially created a new type of recipient they call a beneficiary. And, and that's important because the uniform guidance is pretty specific about what types of entities or recipients are subject to single audit, and beneficiaries are not subject to single audit. Um, that's generally because the idea of a beneficiary in the past has been an individual. Um, for instance, someone receiving unemployment benefits, we know obviously would not be subject to a single audit. The issue here is the Treasury has extended that definition to entities, including even not-for-profit organizations and potentially other types of uh, government entities like enterprises of a tribal government. And that's important because many local governments have identified these beneficiaries um, is that you're not considering them subrecipients and monitoring for them for uniform guidance purposes. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Uh, I believe this guidance has had some logic in the PPP loans, again, that, that those have not been subject to single audit in some states. Um, did create other similar programs using Sierra funds to provide support to small businesses or not-for-profits due to closures. So it seems reasonable that they would have they would be called beneficiaries and again not subject to single audit. However, you know, this goes back to an earlier point that some awards are not very clear if they actually are passed through award benefits or not. 
Um, I did work with one NFP that received a funding from the state and all the emails, the information received, um, it actually called it a grant agreement. Um, but in reality, it, it really was a not-for-profit beneficiary. So it's just you know, really key that you're getting that term and definition clear with your funder um, or if you're passing through other funds. Um, uh, again, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a beneficiary versus a recipient, this gives them some additional counterpoints of just um, thinking about, you know, how making sure your sub-award documents are clear. Um, from that, um, Amy, do you want to talk a little bit more about the FAFATA reporting requirement? Yeah, um, and, and I do echo what Matt said. Um, I've, I have definitely seen a lot of questions coming up around the CRF funding, um, and a lot of it does get back to the lack of clarity in the um, award documents themselves. Again, you know, you think about, you know, the purpose of a lot of this funding, especially under CARES, was to, to get the money out there as quickly as possible, and unfortunately, um, that means some corners got cut or some things got done differently, and it's it's really causing a lot of issues and questions between, um, a, you know, recipient agencies and going back to states and other um, pass-through entities. So if you're hearing a lot of questions or getting a lot of follow-up questions from people, it, it very well could be as every entity is going through their audit, they're trying to make sure they have all the right information and documentation. As I mentioned earlier, um, one of the big things that is being clarified by OMB and setting a, a pretty high expectation going forward is all of this new funding, with the exception of CRS, is expected to be um, reported through the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act. Um, as I indicated earlier, this really applies to direct recipients of grants that then make first-tier subawards of $25,000 or more. This has probably the biggest impact to state and local governments, um, tribal governments, to the extent that they also then turn around and make first tier awards. You uh, must input this information into the subaward reporting system. Um, for those of you who uh, may not be familiar with it or maybe look at it from a, a different perspective, all of that information feeds into the usaspending.gov website. Um, and so a big part of what the OMB is expecting and what they reiterated both in the 2020 compliance supplement and in that OMB memo we mentioned is that um, this testing and reporting is required on all COVID-19 funding that was in the last year's compliance supplement addendum except for CRF. Treasury specifically excluded CRF from this. And this is bringing um, back a, a, a sort of a compliance area that auditors had uh, not been required to test for, for a number of years. So originally, it was only going to apply to the new COVID-19 specific funding, as we have listed on here. However, it also is going to apply for all single audits going forward from September 30 of 2020. So um, auditors are going to have some expanded testing that they may need to do around this reporting. What makes it um, especially interesting is that um, auditors actually don't have access to the database where this information is input by you. So what auditors are going to have to do is basically uh, sit down with somebody and look over their shoulder um, to see the to log into the system or use some other screen sharing or other mechanism to um, see how the information was input into the system, whether it was done timely, whether all the right information is in the system and agrees to the underlying um, award document. This is going to create a little complexity um, in terms of just how it gets tested. In addition, the OMB is very specific um, about what non-compliance looks like and how it should be reported back. Um, so this is going to be an area where if you if you have federal programs that reporting is a required area of testing, um, be prepared that there's going to be some additional requests and time related to it. Last thing I kind of want to mention before we move on to uniform guidance updates is um, there was a number of government agencies that received um, PPPE or PPE as part of the initial COVID response last year. There is a requirement to include some information about the fair value of, a, of this amount of stuff that was donated to you. It doesn't have to be audited, but if you're getting questions about it, um, just because Yellen B is asking us to put it in a footnote to the SUFA. 
With that, we're going to quickly talk about some updates that were made to uniform guidance um, because, you know, there wasn't enough going on already last year. So with that, um, our next polling question, are you aware that revisions to uniform guidance was issued in 2020? Um, your choices are no, I had no idea there were changes, was aware, um, but have not looked at them, and yes, we've already started an assessment on the impact. Um, I, it really does seem crazy that um, there wasn't enough going on that, that um, in addition to all of the funding and dealing with the pandemic, um, the federal government decided it was also a good time to revisit some of the underlying regulations um, that we've seen with uniform guidance. Matt, what's your sense? Have clients started to become aware of this? Have some already started to dig into it? You know, I think we had some conversations early on when um, the red line version uh, came out, and then that was right before the pandemic started. And so, you know, obviously minds were uh, distracted to other more pressing needs. Um, however, you know, now that um, you know, things are, are starting to slow down a little bit, I should say, you know, they're, they're starting to ask more questions and, and think about, you know, different requirements, especially with the November 2020 deadline, which I know we'll talk about in a little bit, um, having a little bit more impact on new awards that they're, they're seeing. Yeah. Um, looks like 40% of you had no idea there were changes, so good. You're, you're going to learn something new here in the next few minutes. Um, another good 40% of you are aware but haven't looked at them, and there's um, a good 18% of you are already all over it, which is fabulous. Um, so with that, just quickly, um, as I mentioned, because there wasn't enough going on, um, OMB is required under uniform guidance regulation to review the regulations every five years that just unfortunately happened to happen in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, the revisions were finalized and issued into the Federal Register in August of 2020. Um, so you'll see a number of items on these slides that are in green. These are links to some underlying documents. So hopefully if you've downloaded the presentation, the links work for you um, because there's a lot of great resources we're going to quickly cover. Um, there was a subsequent correction that was issued in February, for those of you that are paying attention. Um, this updated one really was what they call cleanup. There was some minor technical corrections that were made, some typo things that were corrected, and a few other minor parts. Um, the online CFR has been updated for all these changes. But really, the bulk of the changes happened in the August version. And that August version um, impacted these listed CFR references. So it, it made some um, updates to Part 25, 170, 183, and Part 200, which is the part that most of us are, are much more familiar with, which is where the underlying uniform guidance comes from. Um, a lot of the changes that were made in some of these other parts really um, relate more specifically to the federal agencies, so the, the creators of federal programs. Um, not to say that you shouldn't be aware of them, but in some cases, they may be a little less applicable to you. Um, a couple of implementation resources I highly recommend are these first two, which is a redline version of the update. Um, and then the second one is a crosswalk between the original uniform guidance and these changes. I think these are probably going to be the two most useful in terms of quickly looking at them and getting a sense for what changed and what potentially are areas that would apply to your organization. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Matt to talk a little bit about the effective dates and some of the specific changes. Thanks, Amy. I know there's been some questions about whether these slides will be available, and I think Danielle will touch on that a little bit at the end, but yes, they will, and uh, we'll make sure that the links are active there for you all so that you can um, access them as you need them. Um, you know, one of the tricky parts um, of these changes has been, you know, having multiple effective dates, and as I mentioned a little earlier, um, really November 2020 is when uh, most of the effective items uh, will be um, uh, come, come to fruition. Um, obviously, you know, at the time these were first published, we weren't thinking about the pandemic and sort of the volume of other um, guidance that would come out, or even just the amount of awards, too, that would be subject to this. Um, but just real briefly, a couple of items that were effective immediately in August were 
um, uh, or the pro prohibition and the purchasing and procurement of certain telecommunication equipment. I think most people have heard this on the news, but the reason for this is because the FCC actually, um, you know, deemed Huawei and ZTE as um, national security risk um, to communications, and you know they're obviously one of the biggest uh, providers of telecommunications equipment, um, for like smartphones and other gear, um, in in the world really, um, and and this all sort of stems back to the 5G network. Um, um, upgrade. So um, just be aware, you know, that you're thinking about, again, about any vendors and going through your procurement process and um, looking at the um, uh, the list of, you know, uh, parties that um, we're not allowed to engage with. Um, and, you know, thinking about this, really the U.S. isn't alone in, in banning the use of their equipment. I think over three dozen countries have actually done the same. Right. Um, so just the one emphasis I wanted to make here again is that these changes are all perspective. So, you know, clients that are going to have to really look really hard at internal policies uh, to consider the timing issues associated with some of these requirements of uniform guidance. Um, you got to ensure that you've updated your internal policies and controls as well to address these changes. Um, the challenge, of course, is, you know, no one wants to be managing against two different policies. Um, so you want to think about again, again about and considering when the changes are impactful, um, so that you're fa factoring them in for um, awards going forward. Um, uh, there, of course, added issues for clients um, regarding some conflicts from different federal agencies. Um, the uniform guidance uh, and its changes have to actually be adopted by each federal agency. So although there are some federal agencies that do adopt the uniform guidance by reference. Um, the other ones have to actually adopt them in their own different CFRs. So make sure that you're looking at um, these different agencies. We have a list here of those that are automatic. Um, it can cause some confusion to everyone. Um, so it's probably most important that your different um, program directors are familiar with it, their types of awards and again, where that funding is coming from and how it'll impact them. Um, one of the biggest changes we've seen is just the volume of uh, definition changes. Um, you know, there are, the most interesting definition change that I thought I saw was really the improper payment definition. Um, it was expanded to include, you know, basically an inappropriate denial of a payment or service. So in essence, an underpayment, um, even if you might have received a benefit from a vendor or um, to an eligible participant is also considered to be an improper payment, um, could be considered an unallowable cost uh, during an audit. Um, and there's definitely been a lot of concern during COVID, you know, with employees scanning documents from phones and emailing them, the images are blurring or becoming ineligible. As one of the other clarifications of an improper payment is that, um, you know, that there's insufficient documentation for it. Um, so again, I recommend, you know, to the extent that your internal policies or procedures reference any of these, these words, um, that you have definitions that are updated internally as well. So I know we're close to the end of time. Uh, I just want to touch on a couple of different um, themes that we're seeing. Um, there is a redline version of the uniform guidance that has been posted, and I think that's really helpful for you all to understand and, and look through. Um, you know, many of the updates are really just formatting changes, small corrections, um, probably that should have been caught in the original issuance, um, but weren't caught until for publication. Um, one of the biggest is that with FASB and GASB having updated their terms on leases, um, going away from that term capital leases, there's been updates uh, within the uniform guidance specifically call that out in the new language. Um, we're going away from the use of CFDA or Catalog of Federal Domestic Awards um, and simply using the term assistance listing um, when we're reporting on CFAs or other references. Um, and that, of course, can be found on beta.sam.gov. Um, I believe really this new phraseology is really just to make it more clear to different readers of what we're talking about. CFDA was another acronym that a lot of um, individuals that are not so familiar with awards had some confusion over. Um, as Amy already mentioned, there's a greater emphasis on performance. We've seen that in the most recent um, memorandum that has come out. There's been a focus on you know, whether the outcome of a grant award met its original um, objectives. And it's possible in future compliance implements, we might see more direction and area for how we're testing this. And then finally, um, uh, OMB now requires all subaward agreements include um, subaward budgets, um, the both period start date and end, end date. Um, the OMB added clarifying language around approving indirect costs for subrecipients. Uh, specifically, if there are, you know, no approved rate exists, the past entity must determine that the appropriate rate is in collaboration with the subrecipient, uh, which is either a negotiated indirect cost rate um, uh, between the pastor entity and the subrecipient or the de minimis rate. Um, the biggest changes to procurement standards is that 
OMB did not make any changes to the sort of five to approved methods of procurement, but instead they grouped the methods into three sort of more general categories. So there's an informal category that includes your historic micro purchase and small purchase. Uh, there's a formal uh, category, which includes like your sealed bids, proposals, and then of course the non-competitive sort of sole source uh, procurements. The language was updated to recognize the previously approved increase in the micro purchase threshold, which was $3,500 to $10,000. That's, that's a pretty big change to be aware of. Um, and micro purchases continue to be awarded without soliciting competitive price or you know rate quotations, um, as long as you as a non-federal entity consider that price to be reasonable. However, you know, clarifying that language was added, um, stating that something is reasonable should still be based on your research experience, you know, your purchase history, um, to really make that determination and documenting that in your files accordingly. Uh, the guidance also noted that purchase cards can be used for micro purchases if procedures are documented and approved by the non-federal entity. Um, and then finally, language was updated to recognize the increase in this, um, in this um, the significant purchase thresholds from $150,000 to $250,000. Um, however, and this is key, organizations are still responsible for determining um, whether an appropriate simplified acquisition threshold is, is $250,000 for themselves. Um, basically, if you have a lower threshold for that rate in your own policy, the government expects you to take the same amount of care in applying that to any federal grants. Um, and then, you know, competition must be the same across the board, whether it's federal money or, or your own. All right, and with that, uh, I'll give it back over briefly, Amy, to um, pull everything together. Yeah, um, it's, you know, I don't think any of us could say this enough. It's been a, a very unprecedented time um, and continues to be to some extent. Um, so I know we covered a lot in this short one hour together. Um, we hope that you walk away understanding that um, it has been unprecedented. The amount of federal funding that is ongoing is, is larger than we've ever seen to date. Um, and I think all of us are going to have to continue to remain patient as the rules and regulations continue to evolve and change. Um, I think it's incredibly important um, that you just continue to talk, share information with each other, make sure for those of you that have to deal with your auditors that there's a lot of ongoing conversation around what these delays may mean and, and what, what it's going to take to get through um, all of the compliance audit. And importantly, um, just make sure someone is a, aware of the changes to uniform guidance and that you really are going through your internal policies and looking at where changes may need to be made. Um, especially for those of you that do a lot of pass-through granting, so states, counties, cities, um, a lot of the updates in there are going to require you to revisit your pass-through grant awards and documents and ensure that you're incorporating the updated information in them to um, your subrecipients. We have received a number of questions. We're not going to be able to get through all of them today, um, but we will look through them all after the end of this program and try to get back to you um, individually if we can. Um, there were several questions around the differences between subrecipient, contractors, beneficiaries. Um, I certainly would encourage you to read uniform guidance definitions, but generally the biggest issue is a subrecipient is receiving grant funding for the purpose of then delivering a program to other individuals. And so under uniform guidance, a subrecipient is generally subject to single audit and compliance requirements. A contractor, um, as a contrast, is, is really an organization that's essentially being hired to do something they already do for others. So you're giving, you may be using federal awards to pay them, but they're really just providing a service, a very similar service that they may provide to other individuals. Um, for revenue, and in that case, they would not be subject to single audit or compliance purposes. And then, of course, uh, Treasury expanded the concept of beneficiary. It's not really a contractor, but um, as Matt sort of mentioned, is really a uh, entity or person receiving the ultimate amount or benefit. Um, so think about unemployment to an individual. They're the end beneficiary of that program. They are not subject to single audit. These have become very important terms because it is driving a lot of what needs to be reported. With that, I know we have some closing remarks from our producer. I will turn it over to her. 
Thank you, Matt and Amy, for a great presentation today. Unfortunately, we're out of time. As Amy mentioned, if you submitted questions that we did not get to, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. Or you may reach out to the presenters directly. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide and deck handout window to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window to the right of the slide view. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy of your CPE certificate will be emailed within three weeks. Should you have any difficulty downloading it now? Finally, here's a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us. We hope you'll join us again next time.